All right, for this module, I thought it would be beneficial to examine the emerging financial market for traditionally unpriced ecosystem services with a focus on carbon sequestration. We have examined, to some extent, the methods by which saw timber and pulpwood are sold and purchased, and these, these tangible forest values are pretty easy to conceptualize. Um, and after this course, you should all be aware that healthy, productive forest land has value for a number of reasons. Some of that value is associated with the commodities that may be harvested from the forest, like saw timber or pulpwood. Some value is associated with the ecological benefits provided by the forest. And some value is associated with how the presence of forest land increases our quality of life in a, in a broad context. One of the primary ecological values associated with forest land is its ability to take in and store carbon. This process is referred to as carbon sequestration. Over the past several years, has been a, there has been a growing market for what are referred to as carbon credits. Essentially, it is now possible for a landowner to sell the carbon sequestered by his or her forest land to be purchased by a buyer interested in offsetting their own carbon footprint. It's a complicated process, but we'll take a look at it here today. This market, uh, for what are what are referred to as carbon credits, is, is really based in climate science. Uh, there's broad global scientific consensus that there has been an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide as a result of, of human activity. Of primary importance is the burning of fossil fuels for energy, and, and that's what this graph here on the um, on the slide is, is indicating. As we'll see on the next slide, carbon dioxide functions as a greenhouse gas. The, the presence of elevated CO2, CO2 levels is, is a primary driver of climate change. Atmospheric greenhouse gases are so named because they have the ability to trap and block heat radiating from Earth towards space. Like a greenhouse, radiant heat from the sun enters, but it's blocked on its way out. Water vapor, methane, um, and nitrous oxide are all greenhouse gases, but carbon dioxide is recognized as one of the, the most impactful, especially relative to its abundance in the atmosphere. You, you should all be aware now of the role forests play within this, this carbon cycle. Uh, the picture here on the slide is of the angel oak, um, a large live oak near Charleston, South Carolina. It's roughly 400 to 500 years old. Uh, clearly, th this thing, just on its own, this one tree is, is storing an awful lot of carbon. Uh, just to review, remember that during the process of photosynthesis, trees take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combine that carbon dioxide with water to create simple sugars utilizing the energy of the sun. Those sugars are utilized as um, the, the carbohydrate building blocks for the tree. Some material becomes carbon-based cellulose, or wood fiber. Carbon is stored uh, throughout the tree as wood, including throughout the root system. In addition, carbon is stored throughout the soil of forested ecosystems as well. As trees die and decompose, that carbon is released back into the atmosphere at a relatively slow rate. When forest fires occur and trees are burned, carbon is released through combustion at a much faster rate. Healthy, vigorous forest land sequesters more carbon than it emits, so it, it functions as a carbon sink. When trees are harvested and turned into wood products, those products store carbon as well. Solid wood products um, and construction materials, you know, 2 by 4s um, sheathing, uh, tables, things like that, um, store carbon for an extended period of time. Just think about how long those, those wood products will actually be in existence. Paper products function to store carbon for a shorter period of time. And biomass fuel stores carbon until it's burned for energy. Um, it's just sort of a, you know, speeds up the, the, the combustion process. In a, in a broad sense, younger forests sequester carbon at a faster rate, while older forests store more car carbon on a per acre basis. Uh, these young forests sequester carbon rapidly because of the amount of live foliage present uh, relative to the size of each small tree. Photosynthesis occurs most rapidly at this stage of forest development. The amount of carbon able to be stored within a forest ecosystem is not infinite. As forests age, eventually they reach a point where the amount of carbon sequestered by growth is roughly equal to um, what is lost through decomposition. The point at which this occurs is different for all ecosystem types, and it varies with the longevity of the primary tree species, 
uh, within the forest and, and with the natural disturbance regime of the ecosystem. This slide here displays the young, recently established stand of longleaf pine on the left. Uh, it's, in this instance, carbon is, is sequestered rapidly. The image on the right displays an older longleaf pine forest with, with multiple age classes present in the canopy. This stand stores more, ca more carbon than the one on the left, though the rate at which the carbon is being sequestered is slower. In addition, the amount of carbon that is stored within a managed forest ecosystem is, is really dependent on the given management regime, how those trees are harvested and at, at what point they're harvested. This slide here displays two different management regi regimes or management programs, each designed to grow and harvest loblolly pine saw timber. The image on the left displays what, what we could think of as an intensive form of management, where loblolly pine is grown in a plantation setting. Uh, the area is clear-cut once those trees are deemed mature and then replanted with loblolly pine seedlings of, of what's referred to as improved genetic stock. Uh, those seedlings are planted on a regular spacing, a controlled spacing, um, and then they are, they're clear-cut again once, once they've reached maturity and the process starts all over. The image on the right displays a seed tree harvest, a term that you guys should all be familiar with after the silviculture lecture. With this system, canopy trees are left behind following the initial harvest to provide a seed source for the new generation, um, the, new, the new regeneration that's about to be established. Once those seedlings are established, the canopy seed trees are removed as well. There is less control of, of seedling spacing and development timing, but, but this seed tree method more closely resembles how a stand would look and respond following a natural stand replacing disturbance. Also, these extensive management regimes tend to utilize longer rotation lengths, right? Those seed trees are there for a longer period of time than the loblolly pine trees that were present on the left side of the slide. Um, they also tend to leave behind more coarse woody debris on the forest floor, more woody material, more standing dead material, um, resulting in greater carbon storage over time. So these, again, these, these management regimes that sort of mimic the natural disturbance and utilize longer rotation lengths, you know, they hold on to the trees for a longer period of time, they tend to be, um, they tend to have a greater ability to, to store carbon over the, lo over the long haul. So active forest management um, can result in, in maximizing the amount of carbon storage. It, in a given forest ecosystem um, because of the fact that carbon sequestration eventually plateaus for most forest ecosystems at some point as growth begins to taper off overall. In order uh, to maximize carbon storage, silviculture systems uh, should be designed to promote tree vigor through properly timed intermediate thinning treatments and also, as I mentioned earlier, utilize long rotation lengths to ensure that the growth potential of the trees present are, are maximized. So now what we need to address is, is really how this marketplace functions. Carbon offsets are, are bought and sold in, in metric ton equivalents. So to visualize this, one carbon credit is roughly equivalent to one hot air balloon filled with carbon dioxide. We'll discuss in a moment how the amount of carbon within a forest is quantified. But first we need to understand which types of projects generate these carbon credits that can be, that can be sold. A landowner may sell forest-based carbon credits if they can demonstrate uh, one of a few different things. Um, first, they, they can do so if they can demonstrate that they are eliminating the chance that their forest land will be converted to some other land use, like farmland or residential, develop, residential development, um, both of which would result in less carbon sequestration overall. This commitment is most often demonstrated by placing a conservation easement on the property, essentially eliminating the chance that, that it could ever be developed. A landowner may also sell credits by establishing a forest on an area of land that is currently in some other land use. An example here would be the conversion of farmland to forest land through the planting of trees. These are referred to as afforestation projects. Landowners may also sell carbon credits if they can demonstrate what's referred to as improved forest management practices. Um, this may involve growing trees for a longer period of time before harvest than what was initially occurring, um, or harvesting less than total growth uh, year to year. The amount of extra carbon stored as a result of, of the improved management is what the landowner has the ability to receive payment for.
any private landowner with a marketable project has the ability to sell carbon credits. However, given the, the cost of the of project development, it really makes uh, it only makes financial sense for larger landowners to develop these projects. Um, usually, they're they're on the order of tens of thousands of dollars to develop. Um, so projects are are, are usually uh, thousands of acres in size. Once a project is developed, then the, the carbon is the carbon stored is quantified. It may be sold through one of several what are referred to as registries. I'll describe those registries here in a minute. The buyers of carbon credits are often companies that would like to demonstrate their commitment to conservation uh, by offsetting the carbon they emit during course of business. In California, there's a regulatory cap on how much a company can actually emit. Beyond that point, they may elect to buy carbon credits from a sequestration project to offset their, emission, their, their carbon emissions above and beyond what they're allowed to emit. Globally, the United Nations Collaborative Program on Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest, degrada forest Degradation, um, or UN RED as it's referred to, is a significant driver of these projects. Under this program, developing nations, um, area of the areas of the world like Latin America and Southeast Asia, the, they are, those governments are actually paid for sequestration projects um, through the World Bank. Um, it's, it's a way for the United Nations to provide a financial incentive for these developing nations to reduce deforestation where there otherwise uh, would not be, where, where there would be an incentive for doing otherwise.